She loved Baltimore and she loved the movies. Christine Mason was the woman behind those fabulous hairstyles in the John Waters movies. Tonight, friends are mourning her death from cancer. But as Ron Match reports, they're also celebrating her life and the life she brought to the big screen. If you saw hairspray, you saw those behemoth beehives, a Baltimore hairstyle all its own, created by this lady, Christine Mason, the stylist who made character hairdos famous in the movies of John Waters. I remember Chris as really having a wonderful sense of humor, of understanding that the hairdos in my movies are so, so important. They define the characters, basically. Underneath it all, I think you're really hip. Like the characters in Cry Baby, or the unforgettable Desperate Living, or Divine's dues in Female Trouble and Polyester. She was the best that she could make hair defy gravity. You know, I mean, it just went straight up in the air and didn't move for a week. Some of Christine Mason's hairstyles have been immortalized in these postcards and posters, and of course, in the movies. And I think Chris's biggest moment was the hairspray beehive wig that blew off Debbie Harry's head and landed on another actress's head. Pat Moran is an Emmy Award winning casting director who worked with Christine and remembers those notorious Baltimore hairdos and that hair hopper humor. You cannot live in Baltimore with any pretense. And she was certainly not pretentious about anything that she did. And she was really a remarkable woman. A remarkable career which will live on through the characters Chris Mason helped create. She was also a friend. Many of the people that start out in my early movies, um, we didn't begin to have a movie career. We did it sort of as, as a group um, committing a, <laughs> I don't know, a crime against beauty. And, and Chris was a willing participant. Ron Matz, WJZ, Eyewitness News. Christine Mason was 49 years old. A memorial service will be held next month. Well, hi, everybody. Looks like we're having a multimedia, multiplanal, multi temporal extravaganza here today. Thanks to Judy Lombardi coming over and videotaping me, telling y'all a story. You know, I love to tell a story. And uh, we're taping this on August 23rd, 1999. Don't know when you're seeing it, but um, hi and goodbye. So anyway, I'm gonna tell you this story because um, lots of people during my illness asked me if there was something that they could do for me. And hopefully after you hear this story, you'll see what you can do for me. Um, I might get a little choked up during the story. I, I, it's, it's very, the story is very moving to me. It's one of my favorite stories um, about how one person can affect so many people's lives just because they love and care. You know, it's, I, I find that very moving. And, um, and know what, uh, how the world would be a different place if everybody did that. You know, I mean, it's just, I'm just totally awed at that. So anyway, so I'm gonna tell you the story, here I am weeping, but I'm gonna tell you the story about um, Hoti, who is called the Laughing Buddha. Hoti is, um, is a funny little guy, you see him a lot out in front of Chinese restaurants or stores, um, always, you know, with a nice big fat belly, carrying his sack with a big smile. He's considered good luck. But his story runs much deeper than that. He was a, a Zen master many centuries ago in China. He had a temple in the street, which was actually a kindergarten for the children. Children who were orphans, uh, abandoned, uh, you know, street ruffians, you know, all that sort of thing. Children who were basically abandoned, who had no one else to teach them and had no one to care and love for them. How he got his teachings across was not just by playing with the kids, but in his sack, he carried candy, fruit, and my favorite is donuts. You know, it's like, I didn't even know they had donuts in ancient Japan, but they did apparently because he handed these kids out donuts, right? So this was his deal, and this is what he did, and he did it for many years. But because he was such an accomplished Zen master, 
There were many people who thought he was wasting his time in the street and should be teaching people who were more, a little more deserving, let's say, in the temple. And he would have none of it. And when people would come up to him and you know, tell him he needed to come to the temple to teach, he would look at them very sternly and hold out a hand and say, give me one penny. And of course they gave him the penny. And he took that penny and he bought his candy and his fruit and his donuts. And this is what he did. Now, just to give you a little background on monks, they have this little unspoken code that if one beats the other in a Zen word game, the other has to do the winner's bidding. And sometimes these bets are unspoken, sometimes they're not. Um, but one day the patriarch of the shrine of the major temple in the city came down and it was apparent that he was going to engage Hoti in a Zen word game and that if, he lo if Hoti lost, he had to come to the temple and, and give up his temple in the streets. So the Zen master was very stern about it and um, he went up to Hoti and he said, um, I want to know what is the essence of Zen? And Hoti looked at him and just plopped his, his bag down on the ground and looked at him and said not a word. He was totally silent, and that was his answer. That was the essence of Zen, the silence, the inner meditating. And then he said, all right, if that is the essence of Zen, then what is the actualization of Zen? He thought he had him, right? But, oh, no. Oh, Hoti, he picks up his sack, puts a big old smile on his face, and he wanders down in some dirty old alley giving kids donuts, you know, and walks away. And it was like, yeah, that is the actualization of Zen. We must bring the ideas that are in our heads into the world. We must actualize in order for things to really be real. You know, he beat the Zen patriarch, which in some cases could have meant that he could have taken over the temple. But his, his way of being was such that he knew that if he did not teach these children, who would? You know, I, I just find that so unselfish and so moving. You know, he gave up, you know, all of these um, fineries because he would have been revered and, you know, gotten to wear like a really great outfit and stuff, you know, had he been like the patriarch of this temple. You know, and he, and you know, but he was like, nah, uh-uh, you know, because he really got the essence and the actualization of Zen. That story has always stuck with me. And uh, one of the things that I decided that, you know, it's like I would try to actualize, actualize, actual, <laughs> okay, we want, you know what word I'm talking about, my Zen and what it meant to me. And to go out in the world and to, you know, give away in a figurative form, and also literally, because I know I've given somebody around here a donut or a candy or a fruit, but to give that to people. And um, if you all would do something for me, and you know, it's like, and, and t I'm gonna tell you, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, I found that out. It is not easy. It takes practice, you know, but it is so rewarding. You know, every day when you go out in the world, pack some figurative sack up with, you know, the candy of compassion and the fruit of understanding and, you know, the, um, the donuts of, of love and, and give these out to people. You know, just someone you meet on the street might need a kind word. The lady at the checkout counter might be having a rough day, you know? I mean, wouldn't you be having a hard day if you were the lady at the checkout counter? I mean, and it doesn't hurt us. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it behooves us to be understanding and loving and compassionate to other people. To sum up, 
there's um, another little story um, about a monk who was trying to build a temple. And he went to this really rich merchant, and he got 500 gold coins, which are called Rio. And you could live on five Rio all year. You know, so this was a ton of money. So he takes the money and he starts to walk away. And the merchant is horrified. He's like, aren't you going to thank me? And the monk turns to him and says, the giver should be thankful. And I'm like, the first time I read that story, I'm like, wow, the giver should be thankful. If you have it in your heart and you have it in your mind and you can actualize, actualize into the world what you have and give it to other people, wow, of course you should be thankful. You know, that you can do that. And what I want to say to all of you is thank you for letting me give to you. Thank you. Well, Christine Mason wasn't as well known to moviegoers as some of John Waters' on-screen characters, but in his commentary tonight, Michael Lusker says she was a type known affectionately by Baltimoreans. Mike. Well, and she helped perpetuate that, uh, that affection. John Waters is always called Baltimore the hairdo capital of the world, where people find a look and stick with it for the rest of their lives. This made Chris Mason the most valuable hairstylist in North America, or at least any John Waters movie where hairstyles stand for so much character or so much parody. She's the one who gave Divine his creations and Edith Massey hers. She seemed a refugee from old Buddy Dean shows where the guys had hair that slicked back like jet streams and the girls went through the tortures of spraying and toilet papering and blotting their hair before they went to sleep at night. Chris Mason understood all this and the attitudes behind it. She had one of her own, independent, anti-authoritarian, and like all those around John Waters, with her own wry take on mainstream America. She was as Baltimore as they come, intolerant of phonies, unimpressed by big shots, and utterly comfortable in a culture that finds hun its most familiar term of endearment. I'm Michael Olesker.